Okay, welcome, uh, bienvenue. We're live today in English and en français. We're on Interprefy and we're on UNESCO's YouTube channel. Please choose the channel accordingly to take advantage of the interpretation that we have today. Well, my name is Guy Berger. I'm secretary at UNESCO's International Programme for the Development of Communication. International Programme for the Development of Communication, IPDC for short, and I will be the master of ceremony for today. We're going to be discussing the future of media development. What does it mean? Is there a future? How do we get that? Well, you're joining today a moment in history with the celebration of 40 years of a unique initiative in the UN system, the United Nations system. This IPDC, which has succeeded in sustaining an amazing level of support for media development over four decades. UNESCO's IPDC is a special program of which I have had the honor to serve as secretary for almost 10 years. Now, if you think that some of your colleagues and friends will be interested in what we're going to be covering, the future of media development, please do share the link to the YouTube stream. And I ask my colleagues to post that link in the chat. Coming back to IPDC, this special program within UNESCO. So every two years, the member states of UNESCO meet and they decide on the direction of the organization as a whole, including what work should be done to support the free flow of information. At the same time, when they meet, they also elect a committee of 39 member states. This is the IPDC, the International Program for the Development of Communication. And this committee gives special emphasis to parts of UNESCO's work, as we will hear during today. In publicizing, the event we're now having, I received amongst the feedback two messages. One came from Professor Livi Obonio, who is a leading journalism professor in Kenya. And he said, thank you for notifying me about this meeting. We, at his journalism school at Daystar University, he said, we are proud beneficiaries of the work of the IPDC. I'm looking forward to the celebrations and thanks for the information. Another message came from Remzi Lani, who is a leader in media development, focusing on Southeastern Europe. And he said in his message, as an early days beneficiary of IPDC projects, we received a radio studio, the first modern one in Albania. Later, I was an IPDC bureau member. I'm more than happy to attend this event. That's what he said. So spontaneous testimony from the ground up about what this program has been doing. So why did the member states create this unique program back in 1980? What is its role in relation to the new conditions of today with COVID, with disinformation? And what about tomorrow? That's what we're going to be discussing in the next two and a half hours. So stay tuned. We've got a vibrant program coming up. We want to take stock and tap ideas about the future of media development, especially in the context of the COVID crisis, whose impact on economies is so very devastating to the media sectors in all countries, and therefore a threat to what the UN Sustainable Development Goals call public access to information and fundamental freedoms. Public access to information and fundamental freedoms. COVID is affecting the ability of the media to meet this goal. Later in the program, we're going to engage with five with live comments. And those who follow us on the interpretive platform can request the floor and respond with their mics and their video cameras once they have it. Those on YouTube, please write your comments and we'll try and cross to you. Right from now, whatever platform you're using, please make good use of the chat forums so that your voices are heard throughout. Please focus on making inputs that are relevant to the subject matter. Of course, it's always nice to hear about your name and where you, you're logging in from, but that by itself doesn't really help us exchange ideas and insights. So let's all have our brains in gear in using the chat, and then we can have a high quality stream of inputs. So tomorrow, 
and then on Thursday, the 39 UNESCO member states who make up the governing council of this IPDC, the International Program for Development of Communication at UNESCO, these 39 member states are holding their regular meetings. So today's discussions are not just a talk show. They could have real influence on the funding and the future programs of IPDC and indeed on media development more, more widely. Well, we're going to kick off the show and I ask my colleague Oscar to uh, begin the, uh, with our message from uh, our Director General, Madame Audrey Ozilay. Oscar, please. Bonjour à tous. I'm Audrey Ozilay. Good morning, everyone. General of UNESCO. I'm delighted to be celebrating the 40th anniversary of the International Programme for the Development of Communication with you. This year's celebration is taking place in unusual circumstances, which have shown us how, today more than ever, we need free and transparent media. As the events of recent months have shown, journalists and information professionals deserve our thanks. They are on the front line when it comes to covering the pandemic. They play an essential role in distinguishing between rumors and reliable information. This exceptional period has reminded us of how important uh, we need to be able to act swiftly. We need rapid responses, like the initiative rolled out by the International Programme for the Development of Communication to address COVID-19. Because in emergency situation, the media play a crucial role in saving lives and providing accurate information. This initiative has allowed us to respond both swiftly and tangibly by supporting community radio stations in India and uh, East and West Africa, by training women journalists in East Africa, and by building media capacity in the Caribbean. For all these reasons, the program's work is essential. It increases citizen awareness while working at the grassroots level, responding to the needs of local populations. In the next few years, the program will continue to play its role in defending freedom of expression and ensuring access to information so we can rise to the challenges of the future. These challenges are multiple. They range from the digital transformation to the economic crisis and our changing habits in terms of reading and consuming information. This is why to celebrate the program's anniversary, UNESCO calls on all of its partners, all of you, to keep up your commitment to the APDC. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, uh, thank you uh, to our Director General for that uh, message of encouragement. Uh, and I hope uh, people are, more people are joining us. I see we have 46 people on the interpretive platform and to those on YouTube, welcome. Again, I just remind you, if you want to follow in French, please uh, follow the channel that is available on both these systems. Now, uh, the Director General of UNESCO called for all of us to keep up commitment to IPDC. One of the staunchest supporters of IPDC is Sweden. And I'm very pleased that we also have uh, coming up now the chair of IPDC who is chair in her individual capacity, but she is also the ambassador of Sweden to UNESCO and to the OECD. So Anna Brunt, thank you for chairing this, this committee of member states. Please, the floor is yours and tell us your opening message. If you can give uh, Anna Brunt the floor, please, uh, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Guy. Distinguished members of the IPDC Council, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this very special event to mark the 40th anniversary of the program, a unique intergovernmental program in the UN system created in 1980 to support independent media through multilateral collaboration. We should remember that this program was created as a response to international tensions on global communications flows, 
which four decades ago were considered to be imbalanced in regard to developing countries telling their own stories. The response of our predecessors was to support media development and communication in developing countries by fostering environments that allow free and independent media to flourish. In this, they also decided to face the challenges of multilateralism with more and better multilateralism. Since then, the Intergovernmental Council of IPDC, with its 39 member states on board, has worked with consensus, united in its quest to support media development. Over the four decades, 120 million US uh, dollars have been fundraised to support more than 2,000 projects in 140 developing countries. The result of this has brought opportunities for training, research and capacity building to many hundreds of media organizations around the world. The 39 member states elected to the IPDC Governing Council have also succeeded through constructive dialogue to find consensus over the years on setting influential global standards and frameworks for the development of free and independent media. The UN Plan of Action for the Safety of Journalists, the monitoring and reporting on safety of journalists and access to information as a fundamental part of Sustainable Development Goal number 16, and the indicators for assessing and improving media development, journalist safety and internet universality are examples of this consensus around a common cause. Today, we are meeting virtually because the world is going through an unprecedented health crisis, a crisis that has magnified that already existing challenges to the economic viability of media organizations. This current crisis poses major and new questions on the media development that we need for the future, as media houses face now existential threats. And with these threats, it is sustainable development and our democracies that are put at risk. Research has well demonstrated the impact of free media on the levels of good governance, or on the contrary, the lack of it on rising levels of corruption. Media development means independent news and journalism which speak truth to the power of disinformation. We need a strong and independent media to keep us informed and alert about developments around gender equality, overcoming poverty and fighting climate change. This is why the UN General Assembly has continuously recognized the importance of IPDC and its work in its annual resolution, Information in the Service of Humanity. Along with all stakeholders in media development, the IPDC constituency should see the current crisis as a new call to action. It reinforces the need for our program to find, together with our donors, partners and beneficiaries, new ways to ensure media development and its relevance to the period at hand. This moment, as underlined by our experience of media service during the pandemic, is an opportunity to recognize journalism as a public good, an essential element of our lives and societies. For this, we need to strengthen professional news media now and in the years to come. Solutions are needed in order to benefit from their contribution to moving beyond repercussions of COVID-19 and getting back on track for development and democracy worldwide. The panelists that we will have with us today will help us reflect on both past achievements and challenges ahead for media development. It is with great satisfaction that I welcome you to this event, which builds on the past to consider the future. And I look forward to your contributions and discussions that will help see the way forward. I thank you for your participation and wish you all a very fruitful meeting. Thank you.
if you've just joined us, if you've just joined us, my name is Guy Berger, and I'm the secretary for IPDC. And you have just heard Ambassador Anna Brunt, who is the chair of this special committee at UNESCO that has promoted media development for 40 years. I just remind you, for those who've just uh, joined us, that you can uh, follow in French or English. I encourage you also to please uh, alert your friends, your colleagues, as to this event that's taking place now. And my colleagues uh, at UNESCO will post the, the YouTube link in the chat. And if you want to see what's coming up in the program, they have already posted the, the program links as well. So 40 years of a unique committee in the United Nations. You know, when IPDC was formed, it was the Cold War and the world was extremely polarized and yet despite the chasm between the different outlooks and the different interests in the geopolitical arena, the states agreed to set up this program to promote media development in the developing countries. Consensus. And ever since then, they've actually been able to maintain this and to deliver. Now, we've got a wonderful video coming up in one second, and I will ask my colleague uh, Oscar to, to get ready to show it, a video giving us some of the history of IPDC. It's extremely interesting because, as Ambassador Brunt said, we look at the past and that gives us some ideas for the future. Please stay with us. We have the video. Oscar, over to you. The International Programme for the Development of Communication is the only intergovernmental initiative of the UN that allocates funds and sets standards to strengthen independent journalism and build up media organisations in developing countries. The IPDC is how UNESCO has boosted the development of media over the years. Over the past 40 years, following the decisions and guidelines of the Intergovernmental Council and its Bureau, the IPDC is focused on projects that target the most urgent issues facing communication development around the world. So ultimately, it helps keep journalists safe. It supports developing media in countries where this is most needed, and it protects and promotes freedom of speech and the public's access to information. How has it played out over the past 40 years? What's been the contribution of the IPDC and its council of 39 states that govern the relevant programs? Let's have a look. The IPDC was created because one of the pillars of UNESCO is precisely communication. Article number one of the UNESCO's constitution, UNESCO will guarantee the free dissemination of ideas by word and image. As the world changes, so does the IPDC. The UN's Sustainable Development Goals have helped the IPDC promote the importance of media development as being key for progress in the bigger picture of health, climate issues, justice, jobs and more. The IPDC has mobilized about 120 million US dollars for about 2,000 initiatives across 140 developing countries and countries in transition. Every year, it supports about 70 projects. The IPDC's rapid response mechanism allows it to move quickly in tackling urgent media development needs, as seen with the Ebola epidemic in West Africa and today with COVID-19. Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, UNESCO's IPDC has supported media in developing countries by setting up information hubs to make sure that accurate information about COVID-19 is spread. The coronavirus crisis can aggravate already challenging media landscapes, particularly for local media, which can lack capacity and resources but which serve the most vulnerable communities. Projects backed by the IPDC are responding to current pressures by getting media organizations to support each other and ramp up the use of digital resources and services. Access to information is fundamental for democratic societies and to ensure that many different voices are heard in the media. 
This is especially important if we want to change the fact that women are severely underrepresented in media, both in terms of decision making and content. In today's digitalized world, we need to ensure that the online environment is rights-based approached, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder driven. As the events of recent months have shown, journalists and information professionals deserve our thanks. They are on the front line when it comes to covering the pandemic. They play an essential role in distinguishing between rumors and reliable information. In the next few years, the program will continue to play its role in defending freedom of expression and ensuring access to information so we can rise to the challenges of the future. This is why to celebrate the program's anniversary, UNESCO calls on all of its partners, all of you, to keep up your commitment to the APDC. Thank you very much. That's part one of the history of uh, IPDC. We'll come to part two in a little while. Uh, if, if you've just joined us, you're watching uh, UNESCO's program on the future of media development, marking the four decades of this unique committee in the UN system of 39 member states called the IPDC. And this committee is uh, uh, in charge of promoting media development in the developing countries. Now, COVID, as everybody knows, has hit economies worldwide, and money is tight for all good causes. But media is not just a good cause, it's a particularly important one. To hear why, we're now going to have a special video message from His Excellency John Kufour, who served as President of Ghana from 2001 to 2009. John Kufour has received numerous awards over the years, particularly for his work in promoting development, including media development, and his foundation runs programs in leadership and governance. He was recently quoted as saying, a free, a free media is not only the bedrock of a functioning democracy and a free society, it is also an essential pillar for an aspiring nation and an ambitious continent. And he went on to warn us and I quote, that pillar is in danger of crumbling around the world. In some countries, this is principally because of political pressure, but in nearly all countries, and especially resource poor countries, like ours, he, he was referring to Ghana, this danger of the crumbling pillar is because increasingly there's no business model to support vibrant independent reporting. And he concluded saying the success of our emerging democracies must be built on an informed society, not a misinformed or manipulated one. Now, recognizing the importance of IPDC, John Kufour, former president of Ghana, has recorded a special message for us today. So don't go away. Let's see what John Kufour has uh, uh, in terms of wisdom about media development and IPDC. Oscar, please show us the message of uh, his, his Excellency, President John Kufour. Ladies and gentlemen, I am John Kufour, former President of the Republic of Ghana. On the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the founding of the International Programme for the Development of Communication within UNESCO, I send you my warm felicitations. Some 72 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly adopted and proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The resolution that adopted Article 19 of that document included the declaration that, and I quote here, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. End of quote. And to give meaning and force to this noble ideal, 40 years ago, 
UNESCO launched the International Programme for the Development of Communication. The IPDC gave itself a mandate to, and I quote again, strengthen the means of mass communication in developing countries by increasing technical and human resources for the media, by developing community media, and by modernizing new news agencies and broadcasting organizations. End of quote. I must, with great appreciation, commend the IPDC that over these 40 years, it has by and large succeeded in carrying out this mandate. I bear testimony to this by the cooperation that the IPDC has had with the media in my own country, Ghana. Over the years, the cooperation between IPDC and the media in Ghana has yielded enormous dividends to the extent that Ghanaian media freedom is a showcase for what should pertain, especially in the context of a developing and emerging democracy. The media in Ghana has contributed immensely to the vibrant democracy and the sustained development that Ghana has achieved over these last few decades. They have contributed to unearthing corruption and malfeasance in government and society. The ongoing emergence of an editorially independent media sphere in Ghana is one of such achievements. Undeniably, the necessity for a vibrant and free media to check governance, to ensure accountability and transparency from the governors to the government, and for the stability and sustenance of good governance, cannot be overemphasized. That is why the media have, described, have been described as the fourth state of the realm. When truly independent and objective, they reinforce the maxim that, and I quote, democracy dies in darkness, end of quote. Indeed, a truly independent and pluralistic media can be described as the oil that breathes accountable and responsive governance. UNESCO's work in supporting the development of communication through the IPDC is thus not ended. It must redouble its efforts in keeping abreast with and even be ahead of both technological and human resource development. This is also why I am supporting a group of venturists with a shared vision in the globalization process to launch a project called the Africa Public Interest Media Initiative. This is designed to create new digital partnerships to revitalize and regenerate Africa-driven media content with a public purpose and make it as widely accessible as possible through re-emergent state broadcasting and other media outlets. This initiative is fashioned as a collaborative to bring together the private sector, civil society organizations, and reform-minded government initiatives to help transform the Africa media sector to work in the public interest and across the continent. Also, I support the International Fund for Public Interest Media Projects, a new initiative that is being sponsored and promoted by the BBC Media Action, the Illuminati Organization, Chatham House, ABN Holdings of UK and Africa, and other similar international institutions. The initiative is designed to mobilize needed resources to address the market failure of the old media establishments and as a vital vehicle to prevent the extinction we are currently witnessing 
of credible media and to find fresh financial models that will empower independent public media to sustain themselves into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I congratulate the IPDC for chalking 40 years and urge it to aspire to achieve a more exciting and even more fruitful next 40 years for the betterment of mankind across the globe. Thank you for your audience. Well, wise words and some concrete pointers uh, from the former Ghanaian president, uh, His Excellency John Kufour. Well, if you've just joined us, we are speaking now about the future of media development. It's the 40th anniversary of UNESCO's special program for media development called the IPDC. Those are the initials of the International Program for the Development of Communication, IPDC. If you're finding this interesting, please share the link to the YouTube stream of this uh, of the proceedings. Uh, you'll find the link in the chat. Well, as we speak, unfortunately, the media is running out of money. Whether we're speaking about public broadcasters, privately owned newspapers, community owned radio stations, or new startups purely online, all of all of them were feeling the pinch even before the pandemic. Now, many are facing a knockout punch as weak economies are pulverizing sustainability. So who better to analyze this than a famous economist? Well, we have a dedicated message now from Professor Joseph Stiglitz, a name I'm sure many will know, he is a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, a former chief economist of the World Bank. He holds 40 honorary degrees. He has been decorated by several governments, including Bolivia, Korea, Republic of Korea, Colombia, Ecuador, and most recently France, where he was appointed a member of the Legion of Honor. He's also one of the members of the Information and, Information and Democracy Commission launched by Reporters Without Borders. We will have a representative of both uh, the Information and Democracy Commission and Reporters Without Borders speaking to us later uh, this morning. Professor Stiglitz's work includes assessment of threats to media independence and a unique taxonomy of these threats where he looks at four overlapping forms of what is called media capture. These are threats related to the kinds of ownership the financial incentives, censorship, and what he also calls cognitive capture, the capture of journalists so they don't do their professional uh, uh, work and their professional service. Well, on hearing about the IPDC's 40th anniversary, Professor Stiglitz read, readily agreed to record a dedicated message for this occasion. Let's hear what he has to say to us. Thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be able to join you in the celebration of the 40th anniversary of UNESCO's International Program for the Development of Communication. Never have the challenges facing the media been greater, and never has the need for a diverse, independent, strong media been greater. Let me elaborate on those two points. Around the world, there are authoritarian figures Demagogues are on the rise. Political scientists, sociologists, economists are trying to understand the forces giving rise to these movements. But whatever the reason, we know the consequences. There are echoes of what happened in the 1930s with the growth of fascism in all its forms. We've already seen the consequences in many countries. These demagogues, authoritarian figures, flourish on nativism, populism, nationalism. They turn people against each other within countries and between countries. Eventually, the light of democracy diminishes. 
and the enlightenment values that have led to the flourishing of mankind is dimmed. The consequences we see in the pandemic. Overall, the demagogues have done poorly in managing COVID-19 and its economic aftermath. The countries that have been based on trust, democracy, human rights, recognizing respect of citizens for each other and the importance of truth and science have done better. And the countries where there's a strong media to disseminate information have done better. A particular concern is how these demagogues, these authoritarian figures, oppose science, truth, and our institutions for ascertaining and disseminating the truth. They've opposed a free and independent media, sometimes with outright suppression, but more generally making it in one way harder for them to thrive. Sometimes they encourage their cronies to buy them up they often attack the free media as representing, reflecting fake news, undermining truth itself, and encouraging skepticism, where no one knows what is the truth. Trump has talked about alternative facts, simple things as how many individuals show up at his inauguration. But these demagogues and authoritarian and authoritarian-like figures also undermine the right to know, the laws governing freedom of information. And this undermines accountability and accompanies other changes to undermine the institutionality of our society, our ability to hold individuals accountable and to make sure we have well-functioning societies. So the need to keep these demagogues in check has never been greater. But this need comes exactly at the time of challenges to the business model of a free and independent media. The viability of the press has often depended on advertising. And the problem is that the development of social media has provided a new means of advertising. The link between news, investigative journalism, communication, and advertising has always been an uncomfortable marriage. It was a joint product, news and advertising, but it was not inevitable. And it was, as we have seen, a fragile marriage. And the social media has clearly undermined it. It's not only undermined the business model, and that's been, of course, very important, but it's also spread mis- and disinformation. It's created echo chambers, making both the need for a free and diverse media greater, but the task confronting a free and diverse media much more difficult. And the question is, what is to be done? Of course, in democracies, we know what is can, what needs to be done, and we actually have the ability to do it. We need to strengthen the free and diverse media with public support. Information is a public good. It's one of the important insights of modern economics. And as a public good, it needs public support. Good information is necessary for the functioning of a strong democratic. Une information de bonne qualité est nécessaire au fonctionnement de l'État. Des pays tels que la Suède ou le Royaume-Uni ont montré que c'est possible. On peut créer des institutions indépendantes. Relevant information and disseminating it widely in a form which is accessible and interesting. And there also needs to be direct citizen support, voluntary contributions. 
And in the thriving democracies, citizens recognize this. And there has been over the years an outpouring of support. Around the world, there needs to be a leveling of the playing field between the social media and the more traditional media. But it has to be done in a careful way. There has to be control of mis- and disinformation, but not in a way that undermines democracy, undermines free speech. Those with strong democracies and democratic institutions have again shown that it can be done. We also know that the international press can play a very important role. They can be more objective, less circumscribed. Even in the United States, we've seen how media like the Financial Times has succeeded in covering the Iraq war and certain Wall Street scandals in ways that domestic media uh, have not always done. It's also important to enshrine the principles of freedom of information, not only the right to tell, but the right of access to information, because without info access to information, the media can't do their job. And neither public nor private entities can be held accountable. UNESCO can play an important role in ensuring these perspectives are strengthened around the world. Thank you, and I wish you the best. Well, you're back to me, Guy Berger. I'm secretary for IPDC, UNESCO's International Program for the Development of Communication. We've just had nutritious, nutritious food for thought about today's challenges from Professor Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist in a spe special message crafted for this occasion today. He spoke about information as a public good. And indeed, this is the theme for UNESCO's World Press Freedom Day celebrations next year in Namibia, in Vintuk. And we will also release a special edition of our report, World Trends in Freedom of Expression and Media Development on this theme of information as a public good. So watch this space. If you've just joined us, you're following UNESCO's 40th anniversary of IPDC, the International Programme for the Development of Communications, and we're talking about the future of media development. To know where we're going, we should understand whence we come. So let's bounce back for a few minutes to history for the second part of our video about the achievements in media development of the IPDC to date. Oscar, my colleague, let it roll. UNESCO and the IPDC have a truly global outlook. 39 member states are elected to the Intergovernmental Council. Morocco has been elected several times. The IPDC's input has had a big impact in the country. Dans le cadre du PIBC, le Programme international de développement de la communication, a bénéficié de. The program could benefit from the digitalization of its processes. The IDPC, IPDC is a very efficient program which enabled uh, student journalists and uh, professional journalists to introduce digital tools in the newsrooms and also in the layout of the media. And since then, their journalistic work has become largely uh, digitalized. Also helped address gender imbalances in the media. The global media landscape has evolved dramatically in the more than 20 years period since Beijing, when media re were recognized as critical for the advancement of women and the achievement of equality between women and men. Section J of the Beijing Platform for Action underlined several issues, among them gender bias in media organizations, degrading and pornographic images of women, and the unexploited potential of information technology for women's progress. In recent years, 
digital media and communications have transformed society. Developments in artificial intelligence and the challenges of big data, along with the twist posed by misinformation and fake news, have enormous implications for women's rights, safety of women journalists, cyber violence and freedom of expression. The IPDC's work has also supported the training of judges across Latin America. En los aspectos de libertad de expresión, acceso a la información pública y protección de los y las periodistas. Ha desarrollado una intensa tarea en la región latinoamericana, ha formado a diferentes formadores, tanto en actividades presenciales como a distancia. Y mediante la cooperación con la red iberoamericana de escuelas judiciales, que represento, lo cual ha permitido llegar prácticamente a todos los países, capacitando a miles de jueces. Indudablemente el impacto es amplio y progresivo y tiende a consolidar la vigencia, respeto y garantía de los principios fundamentales. Press freedom is a priority for the program. Ever since the UNESCO-backed Windhoek Declaration in 1991, the IPDC has been particularly focused on supporting free, pluralistic and independent media in Africa. The IPDC's contribution has been twofold. It has, through diverse training programs, skilled journalists to provide much needed information to the audiences they serve. It has also worked to garner commitments from governments to support media and media development. And importantly, to provide the conducive environment for the media broadly and journalists specifically to operate and do their work safely. So after 40 years of having a global impact, the IPDC is proud of its achievements and still committed to pushing forward. We must, all the human beings, know that we must participate in a multilateral system in order that through participation we can create a system that is based on democracy and democracy means this means that all the citizens are listened that we know what happens because this is also very important as a scientist i know very well that we must know the reality therefore i think that this is now extremely relevant to commemorate the creation of this uh, international program the IPDC faces a new challenge, tackling the economic effects of coronavirus. The pandemic not only cost lives, but it cost jobs. It's created a revenue crisis for media organizations all around the world, and many have not survived. The program is tackling this by ramping up its support of business operations, innovation, and the funding of media outlets. Its specialist guidance has had a big impact on governments, donors, and media. From its proud beginnings to its contemporary undertakings, the IPDC's mission is as relevant today as when it began. Today, this information is one of the biggest dangers facing society. It hurts our health, it harms our ability to stop climate change, it injures our democracy. In the face of this information, a free, pluralistic, independent media is part of the remedy. That's why after 40 years, history is calling on IPDC and on all of us to help secure a free, independent and professional media for the future, for our future. Join this program and do something for press freedom and media independence. Welcome back. If you have just joined us, uh, I'm Guy Berger. I'm the secretary for UNESCO's International Programme for the Development of Communication. We're discussing the future of media development and we've just seen a video about what IPDC has achieved so far in terms of training of journalists, promoting policy reform, research into gender issues about communications and so on. The point was also made in the video that if media outlets go out of business, what does this mean for the work of IPDC? 
no point in training journalists if they're going to lose their jobs a few months down the line. These are the issues we are discussing. Now, I'm pleased to say we have a very exciting moment coming up with a live debate about the future of media development. This is an interactive panel chaired live by none other than Georgia Calvin Smith, who, if you've been watching this program, you will have seen a bit earlier as well in uh, pre-recorded uh, interventions. Well, Georgia Calvin Smith, who's going to run an interactive panel now, uh, is uh, somebody who works in Paris. She's a journalism trainer, a TV news presenter, and she's worked in international media for over a decade. She runs the daily Eye on Africa Bulletin at France 24, um, and uh, that goes out in English, French, and Arabic. She also anchors the weekly Across Africa magazine show, and to show her versatility, her CV tells us she's also a professor of the Brazilian <laughs> martial art of capoeira. <laughs> well, I think this is going to be a super live uh, interactive panel uh, with Georgia. And I do encourage everybody to use the chat and to share the links to this feed with your networks. Georgia, the floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Go, for that very thorough introduction. Uh, all aspects of my experience uh, touched upon there. But um, okay, so thank you all. Every thank you everyone for making the time uh, to join us uh, for this the celebration of the decades of work of the IPDC this morning. Um, so we've just heard about some of the issues and stakes regarding media viability. And I have the honor to say that um, with me now is a very amply qualified panel to discuss uh, possible solutions to this issue. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly crack on with introducing each person after which uh, each one will offer a quick word on the experience. I'm going to start off with Michal Yestrebna, uh, who is the co-founder and managing director at Sembra Media, a non-profit helping Spanish-speaking independent digital media develop sustainable business models. Now, she's been a professor in the master's program in journalism at La Nación and led courses in entrepreneurship and journalism at a number of prestigious universities in Argentina and the States. At just 22, she launched her own magazine before becoming a digital startup consultant specializing in monetization and management. And that was just at 24. Uh, so she co-founded Samba Media with Janine Warner in 25. And as I mentioned, that's where she is at the moment. Uh, Michael, would you like to have a, take a quick moment to uh, expand upon some of your experience and positions? Thank you, Jordan, and I'm thrilled to be here today with you and discussing this important issue in these difficult times. And I'm, uh, I'm just uh, thrilled that we get to discuss the many phases of this crisis media are facing right now, not only uh, um, through sustainability, but also facing the challenges of global uh, democratic um, crisis, uh, economic crisis, and also uh, the uh, inevitable challenge of uh, being more inclusive and diverse as a space and as a representation of our society. So today I'm, I'm thrilled to hear my colleagues and share what we learn at Sembra Media. Thanks very much, Michael. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, so also with us today is Zukiswa Potier. She's the CEO of South Africa's Media Development and Diversity Agency, the MDDA. Now she was officially appointed to that post at the start of this year, previously having spent a decade as its Chief Director of Strategic Management at Government Communications. Now her focus is on offering support in creating sustainable, viable, and vibrant community media outfits. She says that for that, meaningful partnerships with government and other sectors of society are key. She's currently researching the development of the first sustainability model for the community and small commercial sectors in South Africa. Uh, Zikeswa, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Would you like to, uh, to say a few words? Good morning and thank you, Georgia. Excellences, distinguished guests, guests, fellow South Africans, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Bonjour, Sani Bonani. The MDDA was established as an independent and impartial jurisdiction person in 2002. 
Its mandate is to facilitate ownership, control of, and access to the media by previously disadvantaged communities, as well as historically diminished indigenous languages and cultural groups. As a result, all of South African languages can be heard and can be read across the spectrum of the community media in South Africa. However, Despite the crucial role the community media and small commercial media sectors play in our societies, including enhancing the, the democracy, sustainability challenges threaten the very existence of this sector. We are therefore looking at finding innovative solutions to this. For broadcasters, a sustainable model for signal distribution and focused audience, mod, audience measurement are key. And for publishers, an urgent intervention is required to curb their escalating printing and distribution costs. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, So, also with us today is Christophe Delois, um, who's had a long and varied Thank career. Um, he uh, he's currently the Secretary General of the Porters Sans Frontières and the Chair of the Forum on Information and Democracy. He's been the Secretary General of RSF since 2012, but between 2008 and 2012, he was the Director of the CFJ, one of the biggest journalism schools here in France. Prior to that, between 1998 and 2007, he worked as an investigative reporter the weekly news publications Le Point. He's also a documentary film director and best-selling author. Christophe, thanks very much for being us with us this morning. Would you like to say a few words? Merci beaucoup pour Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to UNESCO, Reporter uh, Sans Frontières, Reporters Without Borders, uh, Defense Journalism, uh, its freedom and pluralism, with a very demanding vision of what journalism should be in terms of rights and duties, uh, ethical and professional rules. And we launched uh, the Information Democracy Initiative a little over two years ago. And actually, Joseph Stiglitz, when one of the members of this initiative, in order to work also on the organization of public space, because journalism is confronted with other types of contents today. And uh, the, 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 the very organization of that public uh, space uh, must be uh, considered. But there are other points I'll uh, talk about later. Chinapa, he is the director of news ecosystem development at Google, working on partnerships and collaboration between Google and the news industry as part of the Google News Initiative, or the GNI. Prior to, the, to his current role, he launched the precursor to GNI, the Digital News Initiative, or the DNI. Google's organization aimed at boosting engagement with the European news ecosystem. Now, he joined Google in 2010 to focus on Google News and magazines in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. He's worked in news overall, though, since 1994, first in the launch team of APTV, a year in mergers and acquisitions at United News and Media. And he also spent over nine years at BBC News, ultimately as head of development and rights. Madav, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Would you like to take a few words? Good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. The joys of being virtual is that uh, one can be almost everywhere. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, as Georgia said, I work in Google and our product team on the Google News Initiative, or GNI, as we like to call it, which is our overarching program to enable a sustainable, diverse, and innovative ecosystem of quality news. And, and by the way, if my video is working and you can see me, I have a silly mustache uh, because I'm actually participating in Movember, which is a charity campaign to raise funds for mental health um, and men's health. If you want to know more, you can email me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be alongside such an illustrious panel to discuss one of the most important issues of our time, a thriving and sustainable news media ecosystem. From a Google perspective, we've been working with the news industry for the very, from the very earliest days of Google starting with Google Search and Google News, where we send traffic to publishers. Now, over 24 billion clicks are sent to news publishers uh, every month. Uh, that's 9,000 clicks a second, which is an opportunity for publishers to monetize those clicks, engage with their audiences, and uh, really develop the connections that we've all been talking about uh, and will in the, in the panel session. Um, 
We also provide advertising technology, um, which allows publishers to monetize their content. And we work that on a uh, revenue share basis, which uh, generally starts at about 70%, going up to 95% for the publishers. Um, so we work very much uh, in collaboration with the news industry on that. And two years ago, we created the, the Google News Initiative, GNI, our $300 million commitment to enable a sustainable, diverse, and innovative, innovative ecosystem of quality journalism. Um, I think I'll stop there because I want to hear from others and also get to the discussion as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my love. Hopefully we will have time to, for everybody to get to get a little bit more into their positions and their experience. Um, but let's crack on with uh, the panel discussion, first of all. And I'm going to head first to Michal. Michal, so Sember Media concentrates on tackling some of the challenges to the survival of media outfits, particularly when it comes to startups. What has your experience shown to work best? So at Summer Media, we help independent digital media develop a sustainable business model. Our mission is to empower diverse voices in Spanish media so they can publish valuable information with independence, journalistic integrity, and a positive impact on the community they serve. We firmly believe in starting first and then we go ahead and teach what we learn. And that's why we started with um, a media directory that represents more than 800 digital media publishers in 20 countries in Latin America and the US and Spain. After studying the ecosystem for five years, we realized that innovation doesn't mean the same thing in different countries nor different cities. Um, we have a more profound understanding of independent, uh, um, innovation and uh, journalistic independence. We learned that uh, real powerful innovation start with cohesion, meaning articulating the business model with a deep understanding of the direct and indirect beneficiaries of the media journalistic service. Not only the audience, but policymakers and um, activists and unheard communities. If you can articulate your value proposition with your purpose, uh, with the actual um, market opportunities, you can use innovation as a path to sustainability. In Sembra Media's accelerator program, Velocidad, we work with 10 uh, media startups providing consultancy and financial support. And one of the media we accelerate, El Surtidor, a news organization based in Paraguay, was a has a very particular way of communicating news. They specialize in illustrated news and a format they call scrolly telling, which consists in basically displaying all the um, uh, reporting in a scroll model so they can uh, manage uh, the anxiety and the tolerance to bad news uh, with a, a very active way of progressing in the story. So. Um, they already have this innovative uh, way of working. Um, we um, work with them to understand their community and to understand that they were talking uh, to a very young, diverse, and rural communities too. And um, their goal as a news organization was to give voice to marginalized stories of Paraguay and uncover the corruption that oppress these groups. So their approach uh, to news was already, as I said, technically innovative, but we work with them to strategize first, um, to uh, take their value proposition, to take advantage of the opportunities and find viability. So they focus first on developing a local membership for the faithful community. But they also created a Latin American training program to um, train news outlets to learn how to transform their digital uh, vocabulary into an illustrated one to engage um, more better with their communities. This is a clear role model for the region because these media found three international investors. They diversified their business model. They gave their community a more active role while finding a way to scale from a national media to a regional business. And they use this role and this project to also support and create new alliances. So 
Articulating tech and content innovation with business innovation is key to a more sustainable and also relevant media. Mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind how you know the entire global economy has taken a hit with COVID-19 this year, um, and recovery is going to be hard for everyone, but for smaller mm -hmm. media outlets in countries where the pre-pandemic economy was already weaker, do you think that this idea of pushing for business innovation should or can still be a priority in circumstances like this? Innovation definitely is even more vital when the economy of the country is weak. Um, the market has been failing uh, for many years now. It's not like news for us. Um, the market uh, was mostly um, based in traditional advertising and as we all notice, uh, it's no longer viable for these media. So, and, and if we focus on digital media, especially, it's even less functional. So it doesn't matter where you are in the region or if even the pandemic, it's uh, already a situation we were dealing with. So the independent digital media we work with, uh, which are leader by social entrepreneurs no longer can afford the lack of um, a innovation or a business model. Um, I want to share with you a very interesting case we worked with in uh, Cuba. And um, when the pandemic started, two of the media we work with uh, developed an innovative work process um, by creating an alliance. Um, they merged their teams to lower their exposure to the virus. They shared their content tech and financial resources. And as a result, they were able to develop news product covering the pandemic in the island. They developed a comic series to increase the tolerance to bad news and develop a bot to fight misinformation and respond to COVID-related questions. And the, the interesting thing about their strategy and, and the innovative part, it's not only this merge, because they did merge their, um, uh, their media, they merged their teams. The innovative part was they decided to communicate this uh, strategy to um, international organizations and investors. And as a result of that, they got new investments and also, by creating these uh, news products, they uh, got a more engagement with their audience. They actually grow in a very already difficult situation with the pandemic hit. So this, again, is another example where the innovation isn't just a technical matter. When, the, um, when we think about innovation, of course, we think about tech and content, but we have to also think about two key areas, uh, management and business models. In 2017, we launched a, re a regional report called Inflection Point, where we discovered two key, very important points. Um, diversifying revenue is key in order to be agile in a fast-changing digital market, but also in order to have room to innovate, iterate, and find ways to control, to have control over the editorial decisions. We also found that journalists, uh, for journalists, uh, management is such a taboo topic, just like money is. Um, and we as journalists have no formal training um, in management and that harms the viability of the ecosystem in a huge way. Mm -hmm. Most of the digital media we study haven't hired uh, a person to manage their sales team. And we found that uh, media that have at least one paid person to do so have uh, an annual income uh, surpassing the 100,000 US dollars, while comparing to the media that didn't have any person dedicated to sales, uh, couldn't surpass the 4,000 US dollars in annual income in Latin America. So um, for us, uh, in our consultancy programs, Having us, we have a strong focus on leadership uh, processes and team development, and this intervention has been more impactful than any other intervention, mm -hmm. because when journalists have a strong structural organization with a diverse team, they can innovate and develop better and faster. Mm -hmm.
Uh, thanks very much for that, Michael. So this idea that you know, knowing the, knowing the practicalities of how to build a business, run the, run a business, maximize on you know whatever your passion for telling stories is is essential to the viability of media outfits. So we'll be coming back to Michal uh, at the end of the session to hear a little bit more about um, what she has learned. Um, before we kind of crack on with the rest of the panel, we're very lucky to have been joined by Professor Peter Gress. He had a little bit of trouble um, logging in, but we finally managed to, to snag him. Um, uh, Peter, thanks so much for being here this morning. So uh, what you missed this morning, we've, we've already introduced everyone. So I'm just going to quickly uh, give a little bit of your background. Background and, and invite you just to take a minute just to you know share a little bit about uh, the overview of where you're coming from uh, with uh, those joining us before we dive back into uh, the, the the panel. So um, Peter Grest is an Australian-born journalist. Um, before joining joining the University of Queensland in 2018, he spent 25 years as a foreign correspondent, working in a variety of patches from Yugoslavia to Afghanistan to Africa. In December 2013, um, he and two colleagues were arrested in Cairo on terrorism charges. Following, uh, they were convicted and uh, given seven year sentences. Following international outcry, he was eventually released and went on to become a global champion of press freedoms. Um, he's received numerous international awards, including the Australian Human Rights Commission Medal, the RSL's 2016 Anzac Peace Prize, and the Australian Press Council's 2018 Press Freedom Award. So, Peter, like I said, very glad that you could join us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I did make it. It's been a nightmare, but uh, I, I'm here, and thank you very much for having me. Um, um, take you, yeah, sorry, take a moment. Yes, of course. So, so my background has, has been very much around the intersection of media freedom and national security legislation. But we've also been thinking very much about uh, media freedom in terms of the economic viability of news organisations and journalists to perform their duties. And of course, that fits in very well with, with this particular panel. Um, we've been looking in terms of national security we've been looking at the way in which um, a lot of national security legislation becomes weaponized particularly around the rhetoric in the, in the war on terror and that has then been used to shut down or silence uncomfortable journalism of course in australia uh, last year we had a couple of very famous examples people don't seem to think of australia as the kind of country that, um, that targets journalists but then last year we had two raids by the australian federal police on news organizations on consecutive days looking for the sources of two stories that were related to national security but um, by all accounts didn't threaten or undermine national security but were clearly in the public interest but were also politically embarrassing and so that's been a lot of the focus of our work but increasingly we've started to look at working out how we can support the business models how we can support the kind of innovation that also has been a big topic here in Australia with um, a, uh, an inquiry by the uh, ACCC, the Australian uh, Competition Consumer Commission, which has been examining the, the, the relationship between the, um, the, the big media platforms, the tech platforms, Google and Facebook in particular, and the, uh, the news organisations. And we can talk about that later, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll, we'll be diving back into that um, uh, a little bit later on. Um, but you mentioned there the importance of kind of supporting business models, and that's just a little bit um, uh, that that kind of is a reflection of what Michal was telling us about her work. Um, now we're just going to cross to Zukiswa, who's also working for an agency that is uh, focused on supporting the viability of. Um, of uh, grass work, grassroots uh, media projects. Um, so as I guess you mentioned there, uh, your agency channels funding to projects like this. Um, now, some may need subsidizing for longer than others. Is that a consideration that affects the way or amount of support that you can offer individual outfits that come to you for funding? This is to the case work. Thank you, Georgia. Look, uh, South Africa today has got about 271 licensed broadcasters and six licensed t uh, community televisions and more than 200 community and independent pu publishers from almost nothing pre-democracy Georgia. We have funded about 160 community broadcasters, including four 
uh, television channels and about 100 publishers. Uh, we created over 2,000 jobs and about 800 of these were full-time. We have trained over 3,000 individuals, dispersing a total of 600 million in 17 years. The MTDA is turning 20 in 2023. Our support includes direct and indirect grants, media research, training and development. We have also dispersed about 16 million in this year on emergency relief for this sector. You may be asking yourself, why have we not funded the entire sector if I'm talking about 270, 271 community radio stations and we've only have funded just about 160. The limited government grants coupled with lack of sustainability by these entities are the main challenge in Georgia. At this point, we don't have a distinguishing factor we use to determine how many times we support an entity per se. For as long as the applicant meets the qualifying criteria, it is supported. We have, however, sought to standardize content generation, training and development, operational costs, and capital expenditure for funding. For equity, the entity also tries to spread the funding across all provinces on an annual basis, unless there are serious non-compliance or governance issues with some identified entities. We also support a mix of startup and existing projects on an annual basis. Now, we are of the view that a more responsive and efficient funding model is needed. We are of the view that these entities have different strengths and different weaknesses and require different support at varying levels of their life cycles. The planned development of the sustainability model, the planned uh, development of a sustainability model for the sector, therefore, will be a departure from this uh, wholesale uniform funding that we currently do. It will seek to identify the unique selling points of these entities identify what their unique needs are and pull resources together and almost tailor make the support depending on each defined category. The research will look at the capabilities, economic opportunities available in each of these geographic locations where these are, structural issues, ability to sustain, partially sustain and inability to sustain at all and build support packages informed by this by these outcomes thank you georgia um uh, thanks okay so now um that costs money do you receive enough funding to do what you your, your ambitions um to uh, to do what you want to do and uh, what are the prospects for expanding the kind of funding that is available. For example, are there any plans for working with any of the big tech companies? Oh, yes, there is. Uh, firstly, I think I must explain that the entity is funded through government grants on an annual basis, but mainly from the commercial broadcasters through what we call a universal service and access fund, which is a use of levy, which is a legislated. And so 63% of our budget comes from the commercial broadcasters. Unfortunately, the commercial print due to the economic, lock, economic meltdown are no longer able to, to support the small commercial and community print media in South Africa. However, we also anticipate, Georgia, that both sources of funding will shrink in the next two or three years or even beyond as a result of the impact of COVID on businesses. It is therefore imperative that we look beyond these two sources of funding for support. For instance, our act also provides for us to, to look for funding beyond the borders of South Africa and go and knock on the doors of foreign donors. And we will be doing, we're gearing ourselves to, to be doing that. We currently do not get any or receive any support from the telecommunications companies as well. And our previous discussions with these telecoms pointed out that they were willing to partner with the entity in support uh, of the sector, but only in, in as far as digitalization of the sector is concerned. And we are pursuing, pursuing those discussions. Even though we also initiated talks with the big internet companies, your Google, Facebook, at the beginning of the lockdown, because we were looking at uh, increasing and trying to support, to, to garner more support for the sector. 
And even though they could not promise us anything and they could not assist at the time, we now have secured meetings before the end of this month, sorry, before the end of this year uh, for support uh, from, this, from these big companies. Uh, legislation may also allow telecommunication companies to also make contributions in the development and sustainability of the community media sector. We also think that project or program-based support to finance particular project or program on radio or content in the newspaper can be negotiated with, uh, with the commercial uh, print houses to encourage the community titles to make their content more educational in that it compels both the readers and the advertisers and funders to take notice. And we were working on that. Just yesterday, we were speaking and we had a meeting with one of the state entities and we're talking about incubation programs. We're talking about uh, mentorship because we need uh, we need uh, uh, capacity building just more than a short course or a, a, a day's event. Content that is geared towards health and so forth will assist, we think, will assist in compelling business uh, and to, to support the sector so that they, these entities are able to generate revenue. We need to ensure that the community papers are at the center of participatory democracy by organizing communities where they live, especially ahead of the coming uh, uh, general, sorry, local elections or constituency work to facilitate accountability and feedback to the public. Uh, so those are the plans uh, uh, that we are working towards, Georgia. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tepeswa. Um, Peter, so one of uh, we heard um, uh, Michal mentioning earlier about how the, the kind of traditional part of what has factored into the kind of market failure for kind of some media outlets has been the the fact that basically the traditional um, market that used to be based on traditional advertising just doesn't work in their favour anymore, um, and uh, so. The Australian Competition Commission has actually been trying to re-divert some of the advertising revenue that's actually earned by internet companies back to original content creators and media companies. Um, how does that work and what's the strategy there? Okay, this has been a really controversial topic for the Australian government um, and the uh, media companies and the tech companies, the tech giants, and the tech giants in particular have been objecting to it. What, what's happened, as you said, is that the companies, the, um, as, you, as everyone knows who's worked in, in uh, newspapers will know that uh, the Google and Facebook in particular have sucked in all of the advertising revenue. And we've got this strange situation now where the content that those that the platforms use to drive a lot of uh, viewers and audiences and readers to their to their sites, a lot of the content that they pop, populate their sites with is produced by news organisations. But the revenue that they that um, the tech giants are harvesting um, through the advertising isn't all returned to those news organisations. And so what we've seen now is an is the, trip, the Competition Commission setting up what's called um, a model code, which is a system where the news organisations um, have the right to negotiate with the tech giants um, for better terms to access the content. In other words, they're basically negotiating around copyright agreements. Um, the, the tech giants in particular, and, and by the way, we are talking specifically of Google and Facebook, and I think this is one of the real concerns. Um, those, the, the tech companies have said, listen, this is going to break us. It's going to set a precedent that is going to be damaging for our business across the globe. We can't afford it. It's also unreasonable and unbalanced. It's effectively a shakedown of the tech the tech companies, the platforms, by some of the largest um, news organisations, media companies in Australia, in the country. The companies, the media companies themselves have been saying, listen, we have to get some revenue somehow. We need to redress the imbalance. We need to make sure that we're able to draw uh, draw income from the money that uh, from the advertising revenue that that the tech giants have effectively taken uh, harvested from from the old business models it is highly controversial um, it's not compulsory yet there is the plan is to make this law by the end of the year um, under the scheme um, if the any any news organisation that wants to negotiate with the tech companies is free to do so. Um, if they're not able to reach an agreement between themselves about the terms of copyright sales, then 
um, an independent adjudicator appointed by the government will settle the matter and his decision is binding. So for all, for all of those reasons, it's highly controversial. It's not entirely popular, the thought that most news organisations would love this idea, but I've been speaking to quite a few who think that is that it is highly problematic, including a couple of people who think that what we're trying to do is use um, old analogue era uh, ways of seeing and understanding competition and trying to fix that imbalance of competition through regulation. Um, trying to operate in a digital world which is completely um, inappropriate for, for, for that kind of that kind of protectionist model. Um, we don't yet know how this is going to work out. The government is reviewing submissions, but it looks as though the government is committed to implementing a law by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, tell us more about some of the limitations that some of the critics of the, the current form in the code have, have flagged up. Well, one of the, the critics have been saying that there are an awful lot of smaller companies, including a number of companies that aren't technically considered to be news companies under the definition adopted by the ACCC. So they won't be able to access the, the, the kind of money that, the, um, that, uh, that the, the, the system is designed to deliver back to news organisations. Google and Facebook have both also threatened to withdraw completely from the news market in Australia. Um, in a way, there's a, there's a bit of brinkmanship going on here where the tech giants are themselves saying, listen, if, if, we, if you're going to force us to play by these rules, then we're not interested in playing at all. And if that happens, then it will have a catastrophic effect, not just on the larger news organisations who could probably find other ways around it, but it's going to have a devastating impact on a lot of the smaller publishers, a lot of the, the, the innovative publishers who've developed business models around um, Facebook and Google. That they've developed themselves, they've innovated in ways that explicitly exploit the kind of advantages um, inherent in, in uh, the social media platforms and in Google. And so we're in a situation where we're not only using, in the eyes of some of the critics, we're not only using um, outdated ways of thinking about the internet or thinking about business and trying to apply that to the internet model, which is vastly more sophisticated, but we're also creating a system that favours the big tech giants at the expense of a lot of the smaller, uh, more innovative startups. And so we don't yet know how the government is going to resolve this. We don't know whether there is going to be a solution. But as I said, the, the, the government really does seem to be committed to pushing it through, regardless of some of these criticisms. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, OK, so Christoph. Um, there has been some concern that under some circumstances, public funding of media outlets could mean that editorial content is compromised. So this kind of idea of media capture is a, a, a really a, a central worry to UNESCO and to uh, uh, of course, RSF. Um, so what does it take to stop um, having to choose between government subsidies, which may be essential to the viability of a media outfit, and an outfit's independent media voice. And do you have any examples of, of good practice with it when it comes to this kind of setup? I'm going to go out on a limb. I can't hear Christoph. Is anybody else getting audio, having an audio problem? Yeah. Okay, unfortunately, yeah. it looks... Christoph, just give us one second. Um, may the, the tech demigods possibly offer some, uh, some support or enlightenment on this little problem that we seem to be having here. Okay, bear with us, just two seconds. I'm just going to check and see if anyone's out there who can... Nope. Okay, Christoph, bear with us. 
I'm going to just segue uh, over to Matav in the hopes that someone will sweep in and save us all, audio-wise at least. Um, uh, so Matav, um, so we, would, we, we were hearing from Peter a little earlier on about some of the efforts to try and kind of address that imbalance between uh, the advertising revenue that being kind of generated by big tech and you know, some of the losses that have been incurred by um, media outlets in Australia. Um, but besides the, the, this kind of idea of perhaps kind of conflicting positions on uh, the financing of, of, of media, um, uh, Google itself has still overall been seen to be plowing a lot of cash and resources into supporting media organisations, uh, mainly it looks like it in, in pretty developed countries. Um, so why is that? Why is this a priority for Google? Um, particularly since, you know, in, in some circumstances, we see them as being almost kind of rivals, but yet it's still also a central kind of uh, priority for the company in terms of supporting media organisations. Why is that? Uh, thank you. And I'm hoping my audio is working. Um, well, I would say I'm, uh, I would say we definitely don't see ourselves as rivals and actually we see ourselves as part of the overall ecosystem together uh, with news organizations and why we're doing so much i kind of think about it um, in, for three reasons really firstly from uh, a mission perspective google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally useful and accessible and news is a critical part of that um, i think now more than ever as users are searching for information on the pandemic racial injustice, the worlds of politics, or really just very simply how to, you know, stay on, you know, to work a Zoom meeting, right? But um, secondly, from a business perspective, as I mentioned earlier, Google's advertising technology business is revenue share based. And therefore, we only make money when publisher, when our publishing partners make money. And I think that in when there has been this kind of uh, purported struggle, that there's been a misunderstanding of uh, how Google's businesses work and how Facebook's businesses work. And Google and Facebook are very, two very different companies that with two very different business models. And the reality of Google's, uh, the, the majority of Google's revenue comes from search advertising. This is where someone types in, you know, in the good old days, things like holiday insurance or travel or things like that. And you see an, adver uh, an, an ad there. And, um, you know, uh, advertisers only pay when someone clicks. But the reality is that that is, that is search intent advertising, which is not a business that publishers are in. Publishers are in the display business. And in the display business, the way that Google operates, as I said, is as a supplier. Um, which is very different from uh, the social media companies. And I think that is, that's been one of the kind of misunderstandings that's been out there. But finally, I think why we are, you know, we believe in the, in, in the importance of the news ecosystem is really from a values perspective as well. Um, you know, we believe that an informed citizen makes for a stronger society and a better democracy and quality news is, is fundamental to that. And so that's why we had created the, the Google News Initiative and, you know, I'd like to just kind of highlight one thing that we did because I think it was brought up by uh, uh, Mihail earlier that you know that innovation is is so critically important to the business sustainability of news organizations, and yet at the same time we've also had COVID coming in, and that's why actually with GNI we pivoted our uh, innovation work to create what we call the Journalism Emergency Relief Fund where we helped over 5,600 local newsrooms all over the globe with funding of about $40 million, you know, um, and quite a lot of that not in the, in, in the Western world. Um, and that was simply because we heard very loudly from local news organizations that COVID was having this devastating impact on their business. And therefore, we, we wanted to step up and, and do more because there's no point in, in, in trying to innovate if you're, if you're, you know, you're out of business. And so I think at the end, you know, our, our goals with the, um, uh, with the news industry stay the same. We want to enable a sustainable, diverse and innovative ecosystem of quality journalism. And from our perspective, we try to do that through our products, our tools and training and innovation, um, because we see ourselves as, as part of the ecosystem overall. Um, so I hope that answers your questions somewhat. <laughs> yeah, no, the, you know, I think we spoke yesterday about the umbrella unfurling in terms of, 
in terms of understanding about your position and some of the kind of goals of, of Google. But um, so we've, I mean, we've heard from everyone today about the importance of some of the, the kind of surrounding infrastructure to kind of hold up media organizations to mean that they can you know, actually exist to do the work that they aim to do. Um, you know, business models, tools, funding, but content itself is still key, uh, is still uh, king front of this game. Um, but um, is that something that is a priority for, for Google in terms of, uh, not, not just Google, internet companies in general, in terms of uh, curating the content on platforms and feeds? You know, how can they do that and, and how, can this benefit or harm the viability of media outfits, Madam? I think it's, it's an absolutely critical question. And to, to answer that question again, and, and I say this as a news person, I often joke I'm the technically dumbest person at Google, but I think it's really important to understand the different roles in this ecosystem. And I use the word ecosystem uh, very particularly because it's no longer this kind of linear thing. When I started in TV back in 94, it was very simple. Right. But now we're in an ecosystem where, where there's so many dependencies uh, upon each other. And when we look at, you know, uh, whether it's the technology or the, the, the tech platforms or even regulation, it's really important to understand the role that each play. And so Google is a search engine. And, you know, as such, we surface content and links. So we don't curate content in a way that social networks or publishers do. Um, as I said, you know, we send uh, billions of clicks per month, but at that point, but the publishers are in control. They've got, uh, they, can, they can opt out of uh, Google search and Google news. Um, they can also have the controls about what, they, uh, what is surfaced via, you know, internet protocols called robots.txt. Um, and, you know, people opt in because they actually see the value of search. I think what we did recently, again, based on feedback from, uh, from publishers, is we announced a new product called uh, Google News Showcase, where we will license content from publishers and allow that, which will allow them to provide a new and richer news experience for readers. Um, and this program will, will help participating publishers monetize their content through an enhanced storytelling experience that lets people go deeper into complex stories, stay informed, and be exposed to this in this diversity of uh, information and interest that's out there while the publishers remain in control. And we're, we're actively working with publishers on this uh, in, in Germany and Brazil. And we've uh, had a lot of discussions with many more partners. We've signed over 200 publishers and there, there are many more publishers to, uh, uh, that we're talking to at this point. And I think you know it comes back to the, the the overarching theme of this panel, which is about media viability, uh, and that's a core focus for our our GNI work because, you know, without that, we don't think that the the ecosystem will thrive, and that's why we focus our efforts really around, as I said, the products that we do, whether it's working with the industry on things like uh, accelerated mobile pages, uh, which is an open source form of HTML, or Google products like Subscribe with Google. Um, which is trying to make things easier from a, uh, reduce the friction from a, a payment perspective. But we also do kind of lots of tools and training. And again, going back to something I think that uh, uh, Michal said, you know, the, the understanding of the business line, a part of this is deeply, deeply important. And so mm -hmm. we launched a uh, program called the Digital Growth Program, which was aimed at the business side of news publishers. And we've had, you know, uh, thousands of registrations for this. Uh, we've launched it all over the globe. We've even kicked off a pilot in Nigeria um, because we want to expand uh, more deeply in, in, into Africa. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting to see how people are actually understanding the business side and making it better for the viability overall. And I could go into lots of other stats about what we do with innovation and uh, that, but I'll kind of, I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Madam. Um, so we're going to try once again with Christoph. Christoph, can can you just say again. something quickly? Can we hear? Um, Yay! Yeah. We have Christoph. Excellent. Okay. So what I was asking before is um, uh, about the concern shared by you know bodies like UNESCO and RFS, RSF um, that under some circumstances, public funding of media outlets could mean that editorial comp content can become compromised and um, how one can kind of set up practices where my media outfits can benefit from government subsidies whilst maintaining their independent media voice. On est aujourd'hui face à un... 
Well, we have a risk to gay. Um, and that is media capture. It's, and it goes well beyond funding, public funding, because uh, there can be media capture uh, from private uh, funders. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we published uh, a piece uh, uh, showing that oligarchs uh, shop about the media uh, in order to defend their private interests. And that is also media capture. And then there's another issue, which is the capture of the public space itself. Uh, the way the ecosystem is organized uh, is that it is organized more and more by platforms themselves and no longer by democratic parliaments. So it's the public space, the organization of public deliberation. It goes well beyond journalism, uh, which is uh, subject to a business logic. And we have to move away from that. So there are the two levels that we have to deal with at the exact time where media capture is increasing because of economic uh, Agility, and uh, when that is the case, there is a greater risk of letting go of independence in order to obtain cash. So let me first go back to the capture of public space, which I believe is a very important element. If we want to see to it that democratic guarantees can be imposed for our own deliberation, for our own freedom of expression, we launched uh, the uh, Information Democracy Initiative, which says that as consumers, we sort of uh, abandon the public space to the platforms. However, democratic systems should have their say and should impose again their own values, meaning the obligations of pluralism, of transparency, of promoting viability of information, a whole series uh, which has been uh, studied and which have led to uh, the adoption of a, a, an international uh, partnership by 39 states and the Forum of Information Democracy, which led to uh, uh, recommendations uh, on, uh, on uh, infox and so on and so forth and which has to do with the viability and reliability of information. And uh, uh, have a look at those recommendations. Yesterday, Julie Pozzetti, uh, who is a member of the steering committee, uh, drafted that. And for the implementation, we remain available to you all. And then, as I said this morning, we're going to set up a working group on the media sustainability, which is the very central uh, issue of this workshop. And then we'll have Harlem Desir to discuss that. He's the director of the Information and Democracy Forum, and it's chaired by Rasmus Nielsen, which is the head of Reuters Institute of the University of Oxford. And here again, we remain available to work with you. But then we have the whole issue of how to fund media and the, that of the public funding of media. Even a very uh, liberal uh, essay, such as Walter Whitman, um, a century ago, said that you sh there should be uh, forms of public support to journalism, uh, that journalism was a function which could hardly survive without any public uh, support. But the problem is have we have to make sure that such public support uh, uh, is, is not discretionary, uh, that it is not arbitrary, as is the case in many places. Uh, this support to journalism should not be granted, provided that official lines are supported. Uh, for instance, uh, that is the case when uh, uh, funds are granted according to the editorial lines uh, of the media. This is not acceptable. We have to make sure that there are some criteria which are not discretionary, which do not decide upon the contents um, or according to the contents, and which do not decide to whom funds should be uh, allocated. The, the only uh, rule should be the compliance with ethical rules of journalists and nothing else. So here we have a very clear distinction 
between uh, true news and information media which deserve public support and others which have a lot to do with advertising, propaganda, or, uh, or whatever you may call it, but which do not have anything to do with true journalism. And it's becoming harder to distinguish between the two because the media industry as such does not exist really on digital platforms. All, con all contents are in direct competition with each other and it has become a challenge for the platforms because it's very hard to distinguish what is journalism from what is not and for platforms it's very difficult to to establish who is a journalist and who isn't has, has has done what it can in a way to kind of contribute to this this work of distinguishing you know the the, the kind of the the validity of the content of you know digital news platforms um regardless of their origin as such but uh it's it's created the journalism trust initiative with its indicators for the trustworthiness of in, uh, of journalism now um harking back to some of the discussions that we were having with some of the other contributors about the the the, the contemporary relevance of generating revenue from advertisers. Do you think that this trust initiative that you set up could be a factor that advertisers look to when choosing where to place their ads, that they could work to coherently steer funding towards quality journalism? And what would it take to get a system like that up and running? Uh, well, the question is today that we have many players of very different kinds who make decisions which do have consequences on uh, reliability and viability of journalism, but they can't really afford to make those decisions anymore. Digital platforms, for instance, regarding the algorithm indexation tend to promote some media or favor some media vis-a-vis uh, -vis others. It's their job to do that. They have their own criteria, uh, very, very diverse criteria to do so. But the question is that today they cannot really afford, they do not have the means actually to integrate the concept of reliability of information because we all are a bit contradictory when we criticize digital platforms. One day we'll say that they do not work enough to promote uh, reliability of information or accuracy information or uh, they, that the, uh, they exclude contents which are opposed to freedom of expression and others the next day will say but you're doing too much, uh, you're making decisions which you should not be uh, making King. So we have just to make sure that more is done to 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 to, to check the integrity of contents. So, uh, what do we have to act on at the level of contents themselves or at the level of procedures? Mm. Now, uh, everybody needs reliability indicators. And that goes for advertisers. They need some reliability indicators before they invest in a given or another media. Same thing with regulatory authorities and same thing with charity organization. This is why we launched this huge invest initiative together with UNESCO. On the 19th of December, we published a reference framework under the aegis of the European Organizing Committee, but that uh, applies to uh, the whole world. So we are working on this. We are working on how to implement uh, this initiative, uh, but that requires that for media, we can, media can really assess what is going on and we need a certification system. We need a third party establishing that this or that media does comply with the basic requirements which are listed in the 50-page document, which I invite you to read. And then this information should be disseminated to platform, uh, social media organizers and so on and so forth, and platforms. So we're currently building this market Reporters Without Borders, RSF, did not used to be legitimate in this field, uh, but we did it. Uh, Reporter Without Borders is not in a position to say which media uh, is more reliable than another. The thing is, we just uh, set a list of criteria, and the decision should not be made neither by the states nor by the media themselves. Uh, so we are in the test phase. If you are interested in working on this test phase with us, get in touch with us. 
and then we'll launch this very practically at the beginning of 2021 take Christophe on his offer, please do so. Now, thank you so much for all the panellists for being with us and sharing, you know, just some of their ideas, their experience, their passion for the work that they're doing in kind of ensuring media viability and, you know, in, in ensuring kind of the content itself. Um, Unfortunately, we're running a little bit over. Uh, we were planning on giving everybody about a minute to wrap up. Um, and at the risk of... Uh, you know, uh, still going a little bit longer than than what than we should. I'm still going to give us enough time to have a few words to our contributors. But really, if I can ask you to keep it super short, like max 30 seconds. Um, so we're, we're going to start off in the same order that we began. Uh, Michal, any final comments? So um, I find everything very interesting in this conversation. I would love to take it further, and and I will probably. And I invite you all to to contact me, uh, and I will publish the the my contact and our uh, organization's contact too. Um, from a media development uh, standpoint, I just want to address as a conclusion that it's not everything about uh, money and uh, having the funds uh, and getting the funds towards this ecosystem. It's also about um, how to allocate that uh, funds wisely. And I, one great point that I think we shouldn't uh, uh, about talking in this conversation and I haven't heard yet is also that and there is a lack of representation of women in this market and we found in 2017 that 40% of the media, the media startups we study, independent digital media startups are funded at least by one woman. So this is an unprecedented uh, data. Uh, it, it's not a 50-50 market, but we need to work to get this um, community uh, prepared to manage and to have this opportunity to have a seat at the table. That's why in 2019 we created uh, in a partnership with Google News Initiative um, a management and business mentorship program for women media founders. And I just wanted to um, share this experience because this also has a direct impact in the ecosystem as a market, as a, as a representation of our communities. And, and also as a path to sustainability. There is no sustainability without innovation, business models, or diversity. Thank you very Thank much, you. Um, Zikiswa, um, again, if, uh, um, if I can just insist on our panelists really trying to condense whatever it was that they were going to contribute, uh, because we're really running out of time. So Zikiswa, if you couldn't, wouldn't mind just giving a few, a few final remarks. Thank you very much, Georgia. Cutting shots, as you celebrate the 40th anniversary of UNESCO's International Program for Development and Communication, I would like to congratulate you uh, on the sterling achievements in, in championing media development and diversity. Honestly, I really congratulate you on that. In playing such a crucial role in ensuring media freedoms and access to information, we will obviously, as South Africa Media MDDA, keep in touch with you as we embark on this uncharted road, at least by us, of building a sustainability model for the sector. Again, we know that we can only achieve this through partnerships, solid partnerships. We will therefore be knocking on doors. Some never have been knocked on before to negotiate for support. However, we also believe on building and nurturing a professional and capacitated sector entrenched on its communities. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much, Sukeswa. So when the MDDA comes knocking, open that door, people. Um, next, we've got Peter. Anything to, to add? Yeah, look, I just briefly want to say that I think I commend uh, Google for you know, putting some money into uh, Google News initiatives and other, other um, sources, other ideas that it's, it's, it's initiated. But I think any solution that either relies on the charity of um, a particular company or that focuses on legislative solutions that target particular companies isn't going to work. What we need to deal with um, are fundamental structural problems that have 
destroy the business models and force news uh, journalists to be very sensitive to commercial and political pressure in ways that we haven't seen in, uh, for many, many uh, in the early stages of, of um, the development of the news industry. I think that we can, there are models, the BBC uh, licence fee is a great way of, of public, of harvesting public funds and distributing it through an independent um, organisation, an independent body, which is, which is free, which is separate from the government. Um, whatever we do, I think we need to fundamentally understand that we need to find a way of harvesting uh, public money or corporate funds to pay for journalism that is allowed to perform its 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 civic duty, its its democratic duty, free of political or commercial pressure, we should be relying also on organisations uh, like RSF to produce the kinds of framework that allows us to identify those news organisations. I think that is a viable solution. We're not quite there yet. Thank you very much, Peter. Christoph. Um, en fait, quand tu... Well, in fact, when players are having problems, uh, such as is the case for media today, they could, on an individual basis, do whatever they can to innovate, to keep their heads out of the water, uh, to make sure that they can be sustainable. However, they fall victim to uh, broader causes, just the change of the uh, the paradigm of public space. In such periods of crisis, we have to make sure that, of course, we deal with the symptoms on the one hand, and we support uh, whatever needs support, and any operation is more than welcome. But on the other hand, we should not forget that there are deeper causes, root causes, and that the root causes should be addressed. We should not just leave these media in a sort of survival state. We should really recreate a whole ecosystem which may uh, promote uh, uh, the, uh, the work of journalism with its demanding value. So there is a, a social uh, a mission, a social value, uh, uh, and the whole legal framework and commercial framework should be uh, considered in this light. What? Uh, well, I think first I should say a huge thank you to you, Georgia, to UNESCO, IPDC, and, and of course, Guy, uh, for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, I think the only point that I would make, I hope you got, is that, you know, as our CEO has said, we're an ecosystem company, uh, to put it plainly. And so, therefore, we, we share lots of common goals with, uh, uh, with publishers and with journalism, and we be, believe that it's deeply important. So if you've got any ideas on, on how we can help, because I think, you know, as Mihal said, as Peter said, it's got to be sustainable. It's got to be sustainable. And that's not just about, you know, um, injecting certain things in. That's why we work on, on programs that are enabling and sustainable. Aside from JERF, which was an emergency situation, the, the clue is in the title of the Journalism Emergency Relief Fund. All the programs that we work on are really about enabling and trying to work towards sustainability, diversity, and innovation. Um, so um, if you've got any ideas, send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So I'd really like to thank all our, our panelists, uh, Zukisra Poche, Peter Grass, Christoph Delois, Madhav Chinata, Michal Yastrebna, for taking the time and sharing some of the experience with us. We've talked a bit about, you know, just what it takes to create kind of a, a robust contemporary um, environment to create uh, the viability of media outlets uh, today. Um, I'm now going to hand you back to Guy Berger, who's going to further explore some of the issues to do with this. Thanks very much um, for the honour of, you know, pulling this conversation together. Take care. Well, I can't leave just quite yet. Ah, there you are, Guy. I, just, I felt like I walked out of the room and left everyone alone. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you, Guy. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Um, Georgia, Mada, before you go, you can hear me? Excellent. So uh, thank you, really. What a, an exciting panel. That was really, really uh, so stimulating, so much food for thought. Um, and uh, I see the chat has also been very lively. So now we move into a, a segment where it's for people who are 
watching on YouTube to chip in their comments or people using this Interprefy platform. I see we have got some activity already. So just to remind you, uh, you're uh, watching the 40th anniversary of IPDC, that is UNESCO's program which is, uh, goes by the full name, International Program for the Development of Communications. It's 40 years of IPDC and we are debating the future of media development. We just heard a wonderful panel which pointed out the media needs money, but money is not enough. We heard from one of the, pan one of the panelists, the Kiswa uh, Poche, saying that we also need to consider diversity. You heard from, heard from Miguel uh, Istreba that uh, it must be gender equality, sensitive money, uh, how it's used, innovation is critical. Uh, Christophe Delois spoke about how important it is to have uh, money that doesn't compromise independence. We had uh, Madhav uh, Chinapa speaking about Google's role uh, and why they are involved in supporting uh, media. And then you had uh, Peter Gray speaking about the importance of institutionalizing, not just uh, relying on charity. So uh, this was so interesting. Now, um, please keep those chats going, but uh, I also request uh, now you to um, if you want to speak and you're on the interpreter, you, if you want to speak with audio, please raise your hands and then my colleagues will give the floor and I'll try and moderate that. Please keep comments short because we are running over and we just want to, to cover a lot uh, of, of people uh, here. So I, I do see that uh, we have a comment from Angela in, from Kenya. Uh, please, uh, can somebody, can my colleague give her the floor? And then I also noticed that we have um, uh, comments from Albana Shala, James Dean. Please raise your hands if you want to uh, speak uh, audio. So, uh, Angela from Kenya, please, uh, two minutes for you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning from Kenya. My name is Angela, and uh, I have been listening to the discussion. A number of things I would wish to raise I think that one of the key things that we need to concentrate on is what we call media literacy among as citizens. Uh, media channels are becoming more complicated in terms of safety, in terms of uh, misinformation, in terms of uh, content. But uh, especially for many of us in the developing countries, media literacy among its uh, citizens is uh, wanting. And so as we move towards sophisticated media and as we move towards citizen journalism, it is important that we invest in uh, media literacy. Then uh, I will also think that we need to strengthen what we call community radio or community media. Uh, community media, especially in developing countries, play a key role, especially in terms of helping uh, dispel misinformations and disinformations. In Kenya, for example, as we battle with uh, COVID-19, uh, a lot of information remains at a very high level. So many citizens are not able to get clear, good information on COVID prevention and so on. So community media has not just to give information, but also interpret into different local languages. So we probably might also need to think about ways of empowering community media. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. Those are, are excellent and important points uh, to speak about the, the media and information literacy, the importance of adding value, importance of local languages. This is really uh, so important for understanding media development in a broad sense. So uh, I see we have uh, Austria, um, our ambassador at UNESCO uh, from, uh, from Austria, Claudia Randberg. Please, can she get the floor? And uh, There we are. Yes, hello. I hope you can hear me, Guy. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. I would really like to seize the opportunity to thank uh, the IPDC Chair, Ambassador Brandt of Sweden, and uh, your good self as IPDC sec Secretary and your team for this great event uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of a very unique and impactful program. I think it was really astounding to see the many stellar achievements and the great impact that UNESCO achieved. Thank you very much for 40 years of excellent work through the program. 
Um, I would also like to seize on behalf of Austria to thank the Director General, Madame Azoulay, for her strong commitment to the program and UNESCO's very important mission in the field of communication information, safety of journalists and gender equality. I think uh, uh, the challenges that women journalists face um, are particularly daunting. Um, we've seen throughout the program the daunting challenges to freedom of expression, to the viability of media, uh, and the right to access of information. Uh, I think it showed, it had really testified to the continued importance and relevance of uh, IPDCs, but also UNESCO's mission. We feel UNESCO should really stay at the forefront. Um, Austria is a staunch supporter of freedom of expression and the safety of journalists, as you all know. And just to, um, to, to, to reassure you of uh, our unwavering commitment to keep strengthening the IPDC in working towards the achievement of the Agenda 2030, in particular uh, SDG 16 and uh, on peaceful and inclusive societies and SDG uh, 5 on gender equality. Now a question to um, the many great people that have spoken. Uh, the IPDC, and we've seen that, has really spearheaded uh, many, many great achievements, such as um, innovative multi-stakeholder initiatives um, as the UN Plan of Action on the safety of journalists, or this very unique, um, very important monitoring mechanism, the DG report on safety of journalists. Are there any thoughts um, how, what, what, what new initiatives uh, the IPDC could spearhead in the years to come? Um, what else could, could the IPDC do in, in, in this very um, challenging environment? Thank you very much. And um, well, we hope another 40 years of very successful IPDC program. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, and I, I will request uh, people to respond to you in the chats, uh, just because we're not going to go live back to the panelists, because now we're hearing from yourselves. And I see we have another representative of a member state who's a member of the Council of IPDC, that's the UK, uh, Ivo Gaber. So if he can get the floor and I can just report to you just before he starts speaking that on the YouTube uh, channel, we've had comments from Linje Mayozo who's saying, um, what are the best media business models in Australia? A lot of regional media are shutting down. There's not much revenue anymore. Uh, revenue from global tech giants could be channeled to media development. A person called Connie says, I'm from South Africa, a community radio station. I want to thank the NDDA, Media Development and Diversity Agency, for the work they're doing. Uh, we had Farida Nekzad on the YouTube channel, and she is saying, are there specific plans and solutions for gender balance and support of female journalists, uh, especially in countries uh, that have conflict like Afghanistan? Um, so the, these are, are, are really important points we have to bring into to our thinking about media development going ahead. So uh, I'll update you further on further comments on YouTube, but let's go to Ivo Gabo from uh, representing the UK uh, on that IPDC, UNESCO's uh, committee to promote media development. Thank you very much, Guy, and congratulations on the, you and your team for this event. Um, I just wanted to follow up the remarks from uh, Her Excellency, the, the Ambassador for Sweden, to highlight something that actually um, hasn't been highlighted today, which is the fantastic work the IPDC has done in promoting the safety of journalists. Because although we're just talking about um, current challenges, particularly in terms of big tech and so forth, a very basic challenge for many journalists, particularly in the developing world, is their physical safety. And although we don't have um, IPDC blue helmets, that is a proposal to stand between journalist harassers and journalists, I think we have, um, and particularly in the secretariat and in the field, provided an umbrella, a reassurance. Uh, it's not been obviously total, but, you know, it has been gratifying to see a broad trend of killings of journalists in decline. Now, I might be premature, but it does seem to me that particularly focusing, as the Council has, on the issue of impunity of governments, holding them to account, this has been fantastic work. And I think we should compliment both the Secretariat and ourselves at the IPDC um, for this work, although 
hastily and, and in conclusion, not in any sense being um, com um, complacent. This work will never stop. Journalists, because of the nature of speaking truth to power, will always be threatened, whether it's by governments or those who don't like the truths we're speaking. So um, two cheers, pat on the back, but the work goes on. And particularly, Guy, I know it's been a focus of your work. To you, I think we owe a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you for giving me the floor. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Ivor Gaber from the UK. Uh, uh, you, you are the expert representative on the IPDC from the UK. Uh, I can't take uh, credit uh, for the work done by yourselves as member states, and I've been uh, almost 10 years at IPDC, but we all stand on the shoulders of those who started this, this program. And I would like to just say the safety of journalists indeed is uh, the subject of tomorrow's debate uh, of the Council, of which you remember, uh, we have a report from the Director General on the safety of journalists, and there will be a draft decision. So we look forward to uh, to that. I will ask my colleagues to put in the in the in the, the chats uh, on Interprefi and on YouTube the link if anybody wants to follow the uh, uh, the, the IPDC Council meeting. Now we have uh, another member state, uh, Nikolai Kostov. Uh, representing Russian Federation. Please, uh, Nikolai, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Guy, and my congratulations uh, on uh, this anniversary of uh, our wonderful program, IPDC. You know that uh, my country, Russia, was uh, uh, always together with IPDC. We are uh, members of the IPDC Council. And, uh, of course, uh, it's a pity that uh, this year we celebrate this day uh, only online because it's usually very good to have uh, offline meetings as we had uh, previous uh, years uh, at UNESCO headquarters. And uh, I want to, to say that IPDC, it is not, of course, we have uh, two important uh, questions like freedom of expression and access to information. But IPDC is more uh, a great program which deals also with journalism education, with journalism ethics, with uh, uh, media and information literacy. So IPDC, it's a huge, big program which was created to help people. And we hope all these uh, uh, topics will be uh, in future activities of IPDC. And uh, thank you once again and to your team, to Rosa, for organizing this wonderful event. And uh, uh, let us have tomorrow and next day after tomorrow <laughs> our council meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai Kostov, representing Russian uh, Federation, uh, who is a member of uh, IPDC Council. And as uh, Nikolai said, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, the Council takes important decisions on safety of journalists, on access to information, and on journalism education, amongst other things. So please, uh, anybody interested in all these questions, follow us there also. Now, we have a little bit more time left. I was going to just call on perhaps uh, Albana Shala, who um, mentioned uh, that she's, uh, she, she contributed in the chat. She's a former chair of uh, IPDC, and she represents the Netherlands. So while we just wait for Albana to raise her hand, I uh, see Iceland have raised their hand. Please, Iceland, um, Iceland have just recently joined uh, to support uh, IPDC as uh, this unique UNESCO program, Media Development Iceland. Please, uh, let's, let's, let's hear from you. And then we'll go uh, to Thank you, Shana. Guy. Thank you. Um, and also thank you, Ambassador Anna Brandt, uh, for your in important work for the IPDC and, of course, the promotion of, of free and pluralistic media around the world. I just briefly wanted to take um, the floor uh, and thank the IPTC for for all your important work. Um, Iceland is pleased uh, to have become a contributor to the IPTC uh, last week at this point in time when we are celebrating the, the 40th anniversary of the program. Uh, with our contribution we hope that uh, we can assist in 
implementing all these important projects, um, especially now related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, of course, we've we've heard uh, a lot of examples about um, the infodemic in regards to the pandemic. Uh, but of course, I mean, for for us, uh, safeguarding freedom of speech and, and providing access to information, we feel is essential um, in facing the crisis. Uh, I can also only uh, echo the points brought forward by our UK colleague uh, on the importance uh, of the work being done regarding uh, the safety of, of uh, journalists. Um, and uh, we look forward to continue working with uh, with uh, IPDC in the in the coming years and I can only uh, encourage uh, other countries uh, to join forces with the program uh, thank you guy for for giving me the floor Albana Shala thank you do you hear me yeah okay good morning colleagues thank you guys for giving the floor and congratulations to all the member states on this uh the 40th anniversary of ipdc program indeed i have been honored to chair this program for a couple of years and uh, it has been uh, a highlight in my professional career and for that purpose i would only uh encourage all the member states and all my colleagues to get to know more and to be more collaborative with the program which has achieved great results now i am thinking uh, as not only as a representative of a country but more as a media expert eh? why why i was have been have been involved in the first place if we uh, given the diversity of the speakers that have been today in the panel if we agree that the market has failed to uphold the truth and has favored the growth of the big techs versus pluralism of small media. Could we agree also that information as public good becomes the criteria to evaluate the contributions to the media development? So that is the question that I would that like to pose uh, and <laughs> maybe <laughs> For, for further uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Congratulations also to Iceland for becoming uh, the recent donor of the program and many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albana Shala. Those are, are such important comments also. I think we're going to move on now with the program. Uh, we've had some good uh, comments, but I just want to report from YouTube. We have uh, messages uh, from uh, Professor Manju Rose Matthews in India, uh, making uh, comments about uh, the importance of media development, IPDC. Uh, her own university does fantastic work in this whole space of really uh, educating the future generations of journalists. And then we also have uh, a message in YouTube from Josiel Ram jo Jovial Rantau. And he has, he's the editor of the African Mirror, and I will post in the chat here of the uh, Interpretify an article that he has just done. So thank you, uh, Jovial, for that. Right, well, now we can uh, move on to our next session. Uh, thank you, Jovial. Thank you, Manju Rose. Please keep those comments coming in, in YouTube and uh, in, in the interpretive while we, while we continue here. So let me come back uh, to my script and say that uh, we're now into the, the, basically the final leg here. If you have only joined us now, you're following the debate at UNESCO about the future of media development. Will there be a future for media? What if COVID is not only killing people, but is also killing journalism? What if the media that you follow have to close down with the likelihood that they may never come back? Where will you find your trusted news? If I could just mute their mics uh, for the moment. Okay, we'll uh, ask them to unmute it in a second. So, more and more people are being mobilized about the issues that we have been discussing. 
First, there are some moves to set up an international fund for public interest media. This was mentioned in the in the chat in the interpreting platform, and His Excellency, uh, former Ghanaian President uh, John Kufour, mentioned international fund for public interest media. You can find more about that on the internet. Then we've also seen some countries have had rescue packages for the media during COVID times. We also note that there's a group called the Global Forum for Media Development. It's launched a resounding appeal for action on this financial crisis, the viability crisis for sustainable media. Now, at UNESCO's uh, side, thanks to support from the IPDC, this International Programme for Development of Communication, and also through contributions from UNESCO's multi-donor account for press freedom and safety of journalists, UNESCO is looking forward to making its own contribution in this space of finding solutions for the crisis of media viability, especially for the middle-sized and smaller-sized media. Now, for us at UNESCO, the work of IPDC promoting press freedom and journalistic safety, training of journalists in advanced reporting skills, all this is premised on the existence of a strong and sustainable independent media system online and offline and across public ownership, private ownership and community ownership. Recently, I was in a webinar and a rather incredulous government official asked in relation to this issue of the problems facing media. Do you mean to say the crisis is so bad that if we, the government, call a press conference, there will be barely any journalists to report on that press conference? Unfortunately, the answer was yes. And unfortunately, the answer is, if we want to be relevant for press freedom, training of journalists, safety of journalists, we need journalists, first instance, and therefore we need the strong, independent, viable, sustainable media system. So UNESCO does recognize the imperative to address the fundamental economic challenges to journalism, in addition to all these other issues on the table. And to do this, at UNESCO, we have consulted with media development stakeholders and we have elaborated a plan. The first step of this plan is researching the extent of the crisis. And we will publish the results of this research in the 2021 World Trends Report on Freedom of Expression and Media Development. And the knowledge that we get from the research will inform a process of consulting early next year with stakeholders all around the world, particularly in the developing countries, about what solutions are working and what does not work, and sharing successful experiences between media outlets. And finally, our goal is to produce recommendations for policies for governments, for donors, for internet companies, for advertisers and others, policies that can help secure the essential resources that are required for a viable news media which in turn is the precondition for professional and independent journalism to be produced. Now, of course, we as UNESCO cannot and do not do this alone. We are very pleased that we have a prospect of close cooperation with forthcoming work in this area by the Forum of Information and Democracy. After that, I will also move to another collaboration that we have. But first, to tell you about the Forum of Information and Democracy and to tell us about the work they are planning to do is Harlem Desir, Executive Director of the Forum for Information and Democracy. He is fresh from having served as the representative on freedom of the media for the OSCE, in which capacity he was already promoting extensive cooperation with UNESCO. Previously, Alem Desir was uh, in the government of France as Secretary of State for European Affairs. And the forum that he now heads is the concretization of the international partnership on information and democracy by 38 countries. And the forum that he heads puts into practical recommendations the agreed principles of this partnership for what would be optimum in the global communication and information space. So Alem Desir, Please uh, tell us what you're planning. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Uh, merci, Guy. Cher, uh, cher... 
Thank you, Guy. Dear colleagues, dear friends, first of all, I want to say that I'm delighted to be taking part in this celebration of the 40th anniversary of the International uh, Programme for the Development of Communication, IPDC. And as many speakers this morning said, IPDC has shown itself to be a major initiative for journalists in many countries. And uh, UNESCO was a pioneer uh, worldwide why defending the right to information and the safety of journalists. And as Guy just said, I am speaking as director uh, of uh, the uh, f Forum on, de on Democracy. And uh, the Forum, as a research center amongst other, the Forum uh, under Christophe de Loire uh, from Reporters Without Borders contributes to the implementation of the international partnership on information and democracy signed by 38 states. The sustainability of journalism is part of the mandate and that is a priority we share with UNESCO. Indeed, in spite of all efforts deployed over the past year by IPDC and others, uh, the uh, sea change in the media ecosystem and uh, value capture by platforms uh, uh, and digitization, uh, in fact, impact the sustainability of journalism itself. And that has an impact on uh, uh, many information media. But it's also a danger for democracy itself and our societies. It's a danger for democratic debate, which has to be based on facts. But it's also a danger for our society and individuals. And Joseph Stiglitz recalled this. We need reliable information. As we saw over the past uh, month, facing major crises, pandemics, ch climate change and migration, for instance. So the funding and sustainability of journalism, which a lot has been said about already this morning, is a major democratic challenge and it has to be seen as a, a common good. So we have to find structural systemic solutions in order to ensure the funding of quality independent information and the decade that is starting is going to be uh, crucial for journalism and we have to give the means uh, to those involved uh, to continue their work and that is why as Christophe de Roy said this morning and on the occasion of this anniversary which is also a day for renewed commitment there is uh, the launch of the information and democracy forum of an international group on the sustainability of journalism they will be identifying good practices based on uh, economic models and issuing recommendation for uh, positive uh, uh, legislative uh, uh environment and also recommendations for public uh, pol policies uh, outside the market, uh, that is uh, uh, grants, financial support, etc. It's a working group with uh, 10 uh, international experts, researchers, economists. It will be chaired by Rasmus Nietzschean uh, from the Reuters Institute uh, for Journalism at Oxford University. There will also be the presence of UNESCO at the working group represented by Guy Berger, who will be an observer. And I should like to thank him for his invitation today. And we hope to develop our cooperation throughout the process. Um, Dear friends, in order to act for the sustainability of journalism, we ask you to support the forum's work and to support the call for contributions, which will be launched within the next few days, and to send in your contributions. We hope for a final report on the 31st of May next, the International Day for the Freedom of the Press, which will uh, will also uh, be uh, an important date uh, for the independence of journalism. So I was happy today to present this initiative within the framework of UNESCO because it is important that we join forces in order to defend the future of journalism. Thank you all. 
Thank you, Alem, and congratulations. We are very content to work. We will be delighted to work with you. Dealing with this crisis, the better, and even better is if we align them as much as possible. And thank you for reaching out to us to work together with you on this. Thanks to you, Jack. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Now, as a, a high point also of today's uh, IPDC 40th birthday celebrations, that means the four decades of the International Programme for Development of Communication at UNESCO, we are launching a collaboration with UNESCO and WAN IFRA. WAN IFRA is the World Association of News Publishers. And what they bring to this partnership with UNESCO is 3,000 news publishing companies that represent 18,000 publications in 120 countries. And they bring expertise, extensive data, and their international networks. Now, to speak on behalf of WAN IFRA, the World Association of News Publishers, is Fernando de Yarza Lopez Madrazo. He is also the head of the Association of European Publishers, News Media in Europe. He's a vice president at the Spanish Association of News Publishers. He's also the president of Henio, a Spanish news media group, and chair of Tala de Editores, Spanish, Spain's largest, uh, or the Spanish language largest magazine publisher. He is the president of Juan Ifra. Uh, welcome, Fernando. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Guy. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, a very good morning to you all. May I first thank the Director General of UNESCO, Madame Azoulay, for her recognition of the importance of free and viable independent news, and for her enthusiasm for this partnership that UNESCO and Bonifra are announcing today. It's my honor to be here on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the International Programme for Development of Communication. As one of UNESCO's most important areas of work, the program extension activities have supported media worldwide in confronting some of the most difficult challenges. Today is no exception, and on behalf of UNIFRA, I congratulate all those, past and present, whose efforts have contributed so much and look forward to many more years of collaboration between our organizations in support of media development. To those participants in this online event who are ambassadors and other dignitaries, Wanifra greets you with respect. In this effort, your role is not to be underestimated and we highly value your support. Let me also greet and express appreciation to all participants joining us today because each individual in every organization also has a big part to play. Awareness of the challenges facing media is something that all society needs to have, and each participant here can help some detection. Because unfortunately, this is precisely what we are facing with the global news industry. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to ravage our world, and even as we begin to see a glimmer of light down in this year of darkness, we, the media industry, are confronting our greatest challenge yet. In every country, the pressures on journalism have reached breaking point. The pandemic has greatly accelerated an already precarious financial situation, leaving media everywhere vulnerable as never before. In a few short months, we have gone from warning of the potential disappearance of journalism to facing in harsh, unprecedented reality face on. It is a reality we only need to address. We cannot allow the information deserts to spread or to lose the right diversity and plurality of opinion that makes up a healthy media ecosystem. We must push back on the information vacuum created by the loss of quality professional news, and resist all those who seek to exploit this catastrophic situation. We cannot idly stand by as media working in the public interest are replaced by misinformation and ultimately silence. This is why UNESCO and WANIFRA, two institutions founded under the same spirit of democratic and historical link through the promotion of shared values, are uniting under this initiative to identify, secure, and distribute 
the financial resources that are ultimately needed for appropriate to survive. Through this initiative to support journalism, we aim to strengthen mechanisms for financing from all sources and ensure support to media organizations is delivered. We are looking to share knowledge of resilience, examining viability, and new ways of doing business. And we seek to reaffirm the democratic norms and policies that connect us. We hope this work will have immediate application as well as lasting impact to help address the global emergency facing independent journalism and the media organizations that produce it. When IFRA is a global community of media made up of passionate individuals whose life load is news. Since our inception in 1948, we have charted the heights and lows of an industry devastated by war, challenged to adapt by the arrival of new technologies, and confronted by obstacles to freedom. We are unique as an organization and as an industry in that we uphold a human rights mandate while at the same time safeguarding the skills and business acumen of generations of media professionals. What I wish to convey to you here today is that the UNESCO Winifra Initiative is not just a project on paper with an abstract set of goals and targets. It has an urgent application in the real world, a fact I can testify to on deeply a personal level. My family have been publishers in the beautiful Spanish region of Aragon for the last 125 years. Five generations committed with journalism, democracy, and freedom. My great grandfather was murdered 100 years ago at the front door of the newspaper by anarchists while he was defending press freedom. And we have survived five wars, one of them with more than a million deaths, and also 40 years of dictatorship. But today, we are more concerned than ever because of COVID, the risk of bankruptcy of hundreds, thousands of local newspapers like ours around the world that inform citizens, make them freer, and are fundamental pillar of democracy. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I reiterate one of first commitment to supporting this initiative, to working in partnership with UNESCO and the APC Secretariat, and to deliver on behalf of the news industry and for our societies at large, a way forward. This collaboration is as old as the institutions of UNESCO and Bonifra themselves, dating back to very last early days as we found our way to the aftermath of the last great existential threat to media freedom. We are not strangers to each other or unfamiliar with the task ahead. Naturally, our support to the work of the APDC notably in advance in the United Nations plan of action on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity has become vitally important to our industry. Which brings me to the, my final remark, dedicated to those killed and those imprisoned simply for doing their work as journalists. Today, I want to remember on behalf of all of them, my benevolent friend, Roland Carreño, unjustly detained by the Maduro regime for the sole crime of doing his job, telling the truth. To Roland, his sisters, family and friends, and to all the Rolands of the world, I want to dedicate my memory and my most special support. While it is essential to continue on every front in efforts to save our industry, we must never forget the sacrifice made by the courageous men and women who have gotten us to where we are today. Without them, we simply will have nothing worth saving. Thank you very much. The World Association of News Publishers. Well, colleagues, uh, you're, you have been watching UNESCO's event on the future of media development. It is the 40th anniversary celebration of this unique initiative in the United Nations called the International Programme for the Development of Communication. Everyone, I'm sure, can agree this has been an inspiring, informative and educational celebration of 40 years of the IPDC. This unique programme set up through international cooperation across the divides between countries has promoted media in the developing countries over the years and evolved frameworks for understanding free, pluralistic, 
and independent media online and offline. Well, I think this has been a birthday party to remember. By the way, gifts are welcome. <laughs> that the IPDC has me been maintained over four decades by the member states of UNESCO shows high level recognition by them of the relevance of this initiative and its work. I'm sure they will decide to continue at least for another four decades. The work done by this program is so vital to what the Sustainable Development Goals refer to as public access to information and fundamental freedoms. Public access to information and fundamental freedoms. Something we are still challenged to achieve, even more so in the face of COVID. And something which is so fundamental to societal progress. Let us therefore thank all of us here today who've contributed video messages to our speakers, to those who've contributed in the brainstorm session and who engaged in the chat forums. Indeed, to all participants who've given your attention to one of the most burning issues of our times. And I also wish to thank UNESCO colleagues and our translators for making this possible. In conclusion, for media to play its role in public health, in democracy and in development, we need media development. It is the only way that we can avoid the growth of news deserts in which the weeds of misinformation will flourish without being challenged. And for media development in these critical times, your ideas, your concrete support are vital. Stay in touch with us, check our website regularly and support your local and national media. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.